it was a years long social media campaign that ended with me on the front page of the New York Times with on the literally front page above the fold. And this is back when people still read newspapers like in, in their hands. Mm. <laughs> and to go by a newsstand and to see my face on it, literally with the head title above it, hero of the South Bronx, now accused of betraying it. And I'm like, mm. they're talking about me. Welcome, folks, to episode 23 of If I Rule the World, the podcast that's all about system change and how to make the world a better place. Whatever that looks like, with 8 billion of us, there's probably 8 billion versions of what that looks like. So I'm making it my mission to talk to the game changers, the change makers, the disruptors, the students, the masters, the practitioners of how to make the world a better place. And I'm inviting some blue sky thinking by asking them, if you rule the world, what would you do? But before we get into all of that, let's talk about you. Thank you for all the feedback, the suggestions, the comments about the podcast, like this one from Vicky Hurd. She says, honest, open, delving into the key drivers of harm and good, not purely surface issues, which I was going to say is high praise, but frankly, it's freaking immense coming from Vicky, who is, if you don't know her, the author of the book, Rebugging the Planet and I describe her as a kick-ass campaign strategist who's no stranger to facing the many barriers of positive change. I do know Vicky, but that was an unsolicited comment, so it means a lot. Thank you, Vicky. Um, And then there's this one from Charlotte Keene, who I don't know. Um, I hope I don't anyway. Charlotte says, the openness and honesty around difficult topics and the variety of topics too is opening my eyes and mind to issues I've not considered before. Charlotte, you and me both, because I'll be honest, I set off on this little endeavor of doing a podcast thinking I knew my way around this landscape of system change, that all I really needed was some folks to fill in the details. But you know what? Literally every single guest that's been on this podcast oh, has been a penny drop moment or two, and today is no exception. My guest today is Majora Carter. She's born and raised in South Bronx home of hip-hop, famously, and also, famously, the home of America's, or at least one of America's, most storied, low-status, low-status communities. Majora is a real estate developer and an urban revitalization strategy consultant, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically means she doesn't believe in giving up on communities and neighborhoods that the system has left for dead. Majora's shot to international prominence came when she delivered one of the very first TED Talks. In fact, hers is one of six talks that was used to launch the whole TED Talk brand and their website back in 2006. And her talk was called Greening the Ghetto. And it's still available on YouTube. It's still getting views 18 years on. And it's a tale as old as time, or at least as old as industrialization where marginalized communities get dealt with way more than their fair share of pollution. In the case of the South Bronx, which, if you look on a map, is wedged between the East River and the Harlem River, the community, back in the early noughties, was handling 40% of New York City's commercial waste. It had two sewage treatment plants, four power plants. It was also the site of the world's largest food distribution center. All of that brought 60,000 diesel truck trips through South Bronx each week. And to add to all of this, all this lovely infrastructure blocked access to the river for a community that already had the lowest parks to people ratio in the city. It's really hard not to feel like the system is literally dumping all this crap on you because that's basically what it was. So Majora's idea was really simple. Actually, she said, nobody should have to move out of their neighborhood to live in a better one. So yeah, back in the early noughties, Majora kickstarted a project that would become the first waterside park in the Bronx and eventually would connect the Bronx Greenway, which gives communities access to green and blue spaces. So what went wrong? Because something clearly went south. 
as we heard right at the top of this episode. One of the most overlooked barriers, perhaps, to system change and movement building is the heady mix of human behavior. Relationships, ego, emotion, greed, envy, power plays, all of this not only has potential to splinter movements, but has the potential to take the wind out of the wind of change. I see Majora's story as a love story in three acts. Act one, falling out of love with her community. Act two, falling back in love with her community. And act three, the tough lesson learned that not everybody is going to love you back. Gosh, where did it start? I guess, well, here in the in the South Bronx, which is New York City. And it is, among many things, it's the birthplace of hip hop, which I'm very, very proud of, and of salsa. But what it's also in the birthplace of me, so I really love it. But the other thing about it is that it's often considered, at least for the bulk of my life, like once I started paying attention to such things, as like one of the the places that you didn't want to be born and raised in. You know, it was uh, often cited as the poster child for urban blight. And I think that's when I, my father was a big, he loved the news and would watch it. This was like back in the early 70s, late 60s, when there were only three channels. And so Mm -hmm. that he would literally switch between all of them and we'd watch the news a lot together. And um, it was really interesting. But that's when I started seeing my neighborhood on the news as this horrible place where there was nothing but pimps and pushers and prostitutes. And it was just like the epicenter of all that was wrong in American cities and probably cities around the world. And, and I just thought a couple things I thought one was that, well, that's interesting because I kind of love my neighborhood. There were lots of people <laughs> that, that who loved me and cared for me and it just, yeah, I, it just, there were families that, that I grew up with and it was a lot of stuff like that. But then around that same time, that's also when the fires started and the, the fires, fires be, the fires, literally. And okay, tell us about that. So, so just imagine, so here's like true story. Mm-hmm. I was seven years old and I watched the beginning of summer, school's out beginning of summer, literally in rapid succession, the buildings at both ends of my block were engulfed in flames. And, and I watched people from the neighborhood, or from the block, literally, that I knew, like, crawl up the fire escapes to, like, get little old ladies out, um, you know, out of their burning apartments. Wow. And it was just like, and you just, and on both sides. And then at the end of the summer, my brother was killed in a drug war. And there was, and and so seeing stuff on the news started to make a lot more sense that that's what this neighborhood was. Now, as a kid, I did not understand, you know, that there were very big historical things that put our community in the position where all those things were going to happen. There was Mm -hmm. huge amounts of, first of all, there was systemic racism that essentially made it so that communities would be determined which one were the, the important ones that were going to be supported and which ones were not. And so, so, for example, in terms of the financial disinvestment that we experienced, there was red li- this, this term called redlining, which is a process that banks and other financial institutions use to determine when and where they were going to make investments in communities in terms of mortgages or loans or anything for both businesses and residences. And it turns out that where the areas were shaded red, which was what they considered blighted, and what they considered light was black people. They weren't going to make any kind of investments in those areas. So, for example, the neighborhood that I was living, big lots of black and brown people. So, the the house that my dad bought in the 1940s was essentially worthless because it could not be invested in in any real way. So, and then. There was, of course, influx of drugs coming into the community. There was white flight. The way that highways were then constructed usually went through black and brown communities, sometimes poor, sometimes not. 
Um, mm-hmm. But it was just clear, like those were the neighborhoods that were going to get the worst kind of both policies as well and infrastructure put in place for their almost imminent demise. And it was, but just the, we had just enough to hold on, but it was still a community where it was, we were led to believe that there wasn't much to look forward to in this community. And so if you could escape, you should. And that's how I felt growing up after that summer. It was just so how like, old are you in that summer then? Were you? I was going on eight. I turned eight in October, so I was seven when I saw that. And that's that's literally when it changed in my mind. Like, huh, I am a smart kid. I've got a big brain. Like, I, I can, I watched a lot of TV. So I knew that there was, a, and I read an enormous amount. So I knew there was a big, big world out there that wasn't like where I was from. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to see it. I, but I can't do it here. And it was just like, you know, in a little girl mind, but it wasn't, but that's essentially what I was thinking. And, and I knew enough to know that if I use my brain, use my education, I, and got one, I was going to be able to, be able to go. So that whole idea of like, you measure your success about how far you get away from a community, which literally I grew up and wrote a book about it was though that's when those seeds were planted and just grew. And I wouldn't say blossomed because I think that gives it, that puts a more positive spin on it that I'm willing to give. Mm -hmm. I really feel that when, especially because of systemic racism and all the things associated with it, when you are telling communities that, you need to measure success by how far you get away, that it is such a damning thing to do to those communities. Cause it's never, it's, it's, it's never an issue that it's like, you don't have great people coming up from communities like ours, which still, mm. of course we do. I mean, there isn't a community where you, you're not going to find that, but what I think the, the kind of communities that I'm from, what they do have is this spoken and unspoken idea that the really talented ones in our communities, they should not stay. And we either build up opportunities for them to leave. And it's what often is called brain drain. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what it is. But the spin that I want to put on it is that, yes, it's brain drain, but it's, I think, more importantly, mm-hmm. it is such a horrible the impacts on the communities that that people leave were their own talent, like literally the place that birthed me, you know, the place before I started to understand like, oh, wait, there's some really awful things happening here. In addition to the the fact that I love my neighborhood, well, how interesting would it have been if instead there was like some kind of philosophy or just idea that somehow or another those communities, what we needed to do was was nurture the talent in those communities so that it could instead give back to those neighborhoods and thus the entire neighborhood would do better. Everybody would. And that's just not what we do. Yeah. So I'm trying to picture what that looks like for eight-year-old you. you you've, you've taken us from that moment that you know, it's like really dramatic and stark, actually, this this image of two two buildings burning on either side and obviously a loss of your brother. So what changed? What's Where was the switch where you're like, actually, no, I'm going to stay? Oh, God. Well, it took nearly three decades <laughs> to get to that mm. point. But, um, well, <laughs> it's funny because I did get into a, a bunch of boarding schools through some program in the Bronx or in New York City, you know, that basically took kids from inner city ghettos and put them in the kind of schools where I actually could have gone horseback riding in the morning. They actually had equestrian (laughs) clubs on them. So I ended up going to, my mother just didn't want me to go and get that far away from her, to tell you the truth. Mm. Um, So, but I did, I, I tested into a specialized high school called the Bronx High School of Science. And it's one of the best schools in the, in the country. It's a public school, but it's 
still one of, considered one of the best, but I knew that was going to get me into my name school. And it did. Right. I ended up going to uh, Wesleyan University, which is like part of like the, mm-hmm. the little threes. I was like, okay, I think that that's good. My first choice. So I was very happy. I did. I moved yeah. from being, uh, going into, into neurosurgery, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I ended up just, I decided that I was a, um, that I was much more of a creative spirit and decided to do theater, which was the weirdest thing because I, I don't like being in front of people, but you know, I, I do it for work now, interestingly enough, but I'm definitely an introvert and I'm not sure what excited me about it. And it took me a, a minute to understand that what I really wanted to do was actually a behind the scenes and, and work and, um, mm-hmm. and essentially work. But anyway, that kind of moved me into really wanting to do film. And so I did a production and theory major at Wesleyan and loved it so much and actually got myself into NYU's film school. But I couldn't, oh, this cool. was back in the days when people were still doing film, like not just video, which mm-hmm. was so expensive. And so I ended up deferring and I just didn't have the money to, to, to get the, the loans to pay for school and for my film. It was just like, I just, it was too big of a nut to crack. And during that time, I also went through some stuff. I was married young and it didn't work out. I had to move back in with my parents and it, that, and, and it's still, we're still, the, the fires weren't raging anymore. And most of the, the building stock had been mm-hmm. built up. We lost like 60% of the housing, you know, within our community, literally so much of the population was just gone because they just wasn't any place, any place to live. There are pictures of the South Bronx that looked like the, honestly, it looked like London after the, the bombing, just like shells of, of homes, like seriously. And, and it was just like, that was my neighborhood. You know, you'd walk a couple steps and then there'd be a burnt out building and then you'd walk a few more and there'd be another one. But it was just all over the place. I'm trying to understand. Sorry, sorry, Majora, to interrupt. I'm just jumping in there because like when you see London after the Blitz, you get it. You mm-hmm. understand why it looks like that. Like, <laughs> I know you talk about the fires, but you oh, know, yeah. what was the scale of that? And like, why was oh. it? Was it just lack of investment? Was it really that simple? So just imagine. So so there were a couple things that happened, right? Yeah. One, it was very old housing stock. So mm-hmm. there was, so everything needed some kind of investment. Buildings were built late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm-hmm. So many, a lot of them did have faulty wires, et cetera, needed to be fixed. But the real, real hard driver was the financial disinvestment that was just rammed into communities like the South Bronx, perpetuated by the federal government through like their particular housing strategies that then the banking industry followed suit and supported. So they were like, we're not going to make any real investments in these communities in terms of loans or financing, which if, 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 if housing doesn't get fixed up, you get a, you, you need a mortgage, you have to do improvements, blah, 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 all that stuff. If it doesn't happen, it's going to fall into disrepair. And landlords were literally since they couldn't get money to build up, you know, to like repair their buildings or do anything with them. Many of them, some of them would actually hand over the keys and give the literally to the needs to whoever was living there. Cause it was just too much money. You know, it was just like, I'm just absolving myself of all responsibility and it's just worthless any old way. But then others were literally torching their buildings, like hiring arsonists to torch their, their, their buildings for insurance money. That was wow. very widespread as well. So yeah, so but so imagine at the same time when this is happening, landlords are torching buildings. We've got in New York, in New York State, we had this really awful human being. I'm sure he that something's going on and probably had his own intergenerational trauma to deal with. So I'm trying to be compassionate about him. But mm-hmm. um, Robert Moses was called the master builder because he was also a known racist. And literally went and also hated poor people. So where and the master builder referred to his vision of creating highways as New York is like the epicenter of like this, this network of highways that was literally really only to move rich white people between areas in which they wanted to go through. It didn't matter if they Mm -hmm. bulldozed whole communities in order to build these highways. 
And so the, the, the South Bronx literally is a, it's sort of a spaghetti network of highways that it just, you have to keep in mind, this is where people used to live, small businesses were, and were just gone over is the course of 30 years. Is that what it looks like today? Years. Yeah. Oh, the, the spaghetti networks of highways? Yeah. Absolutely. Homeboy, even literally to make it a nicer example, an, a nicer ride for people to to travel between Westchester County, which is to the north, into Manhattan. Mm -hmm. He literally straightened the river to give them a nicer view, which then, of course, caused all sorts of problems for the river, caused all sorts of problems for the people that lived near it. And often wow. they had their housing destroyed <laughs> in order for it to happen. And so, yeah, we, the Bronx lost 60% of its population during all of this time and an enormous amount of its building stock enormous amount. So it was just like, huh? Yeah, there were definitely streets you could walk down and not see another soul that still had houses, shells of houses on it. This is when I was a kid. So, so this is what, like, we're talking mid seventies into the eighties yeah. by this point? And up until, I think up, definitely up until the eighties, by the time I had, I was, or was forced to move back to my parents' house because mm -hmm. I was broke and needed a cheap place to stay when I was going to graduate mm -hmm. school. Yeah, that was early 90s. And we in the housing stock had been rebuilt, but there wasn't a whole lot of economic infrastructure. And I think even some of the social infrastructure was not where it could be, in part because we, the kind of what we call third, what, what, lots of people call third spaces, the kind of places that build community that's neither in your work or your home space, but give people mm -hmm. reasons to build community on the outside. We just didn't have a whole lot of them, not the parks, not the, not the, not the coffee shops, not like the kind of community spaces that often where people just come to meet. We just didn't have them. And so that I was, was, was notable to me. And so I spent most of my time, I went to NYU, so I spent most of my time downtown. And I was just like, I would get up super early in the morning, even well before classes started and just be out because I was like, there's nothing in this neighborhood for me. And at that point, I'm feeling like I've got this great education, like mm -hmm. I'm going places. So I'm done with this place. It has nothing to offer me, nothing. And I felt that way for a while until I did a program for writers you know, who are working in, in communities around the Bronx and I met this guy named Stephen Sapp, who was a was a poet and a performer and just brilliant and married to an equally amazing woman named Mildred and, and did great things. That was, she was this amazing singer. Oh, my God. But anyway, they did all sorts of things together. And they were building this place that was all about artists and, and community. And I was like, that place sounds great. Didn't realize it was literally two mm -hmm. blocks away from my house. Had no idea until like he literally brought me there when we were walking one day. He's like, oh, you should come, you know, come by because we would take these huge long walks and, and we walked like an hour and he's like, oh, well, like we're going, I'm going to go this way to Hunts Point. And we did and discovered this place. And I fell in love with like the, the vibe and the fact that there were all these artists working on their mm. craft, showcasing it there, putting it out in, within the community. And, and I was really hooked. And, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an artist, you know, I write, blah, blah, blah. I can do some stuff here too. And I did for a while. And that's when, and literally that's when I discovered. So it's like, just like imagine, like suddenly I fell in love with a community that I had hated before that. I didn't know anything like this existed in it, had no idea. And then suddenly I'm like, these are my people. There are people like me in my neighborhood. And I had no idea. And that's when I discovered that our city and state were planning on building this huge waste facility on our waterfront. And I knew a little bit about the kind of environmental stuff that we were dealing with, that there was, you know, we handled it in a lot of the city's, um, a lot of the city's waste already. We also handled a lot of sewage treatment and sewage sludge pelletization. There were a lot of truck traffic um, issues within the neighborhood that all seemed to be we could deal with. And it just seemed so crazy that the city at that moment, they were like, you know what? You can take some more. You can take some more waste. It's like, you're not going to notice it. And that's, I mean, it's something, again, that was another moment in my, just like was inside like, my head. 
almost like an offense. You know, oh God, you're, you're yeah, kind of being offended. I was totally. I was like, what? Like seriously? But this time, yeah, I did have a little education and some distance. And at that point, I was a grown woman, and all I and I understood without a shadow of a doubt. I was like, this is happening because we are a poor community of color and thus politically vulnerable and nobody cares about us. And literally like you could smell it. And I was just like, no, like this is not appropriate. And, and that's when I decided I wanted to be a part of um, just changing the way other folks saw our community so that we could be exactly who we are, which is the proud, awesome folks that have every right to have a wonderful community. So I started, you know, yeah. working on environmental, mostly environmental justice solutions, essentially. But my focus was more on how do you help folks in communities like ours who I think are almost predisposed in many ways to believe that our neighborhood will only be the certain way that it is. There is almost an expectation that things are not going to get that much better. And and I was just like, mm. Mm, I'm, I'm going to try. And, and so, yeah, so I started working on actually giving people not just reasons to fight against something, but what are we fighting for? One of my favorite projects was uh, transforming this dump into a park. It's now a national award-winning park. I wrote the original proposal for the for what essentially brought in about $50 million worth of financing to start work on the South Bronx Greenway project. And, uh, but then I started a green collar job training and placement system, which sadly I think is probably one of, still one of the most successful ones in the country because we did not only just training and then praying that people get jobs, but in the green economy, but actually talking to future employers to make sure that our people were ready to work and, uh, you know, be trained up for what they needed to see happening. So we, just, we still have, we had a really great success rate and the program is still running with a group that mm-hmm. acquired it, which makes me happy. But even all that, and I'm very proud of that work I did, but it left me feeling that there was more that, that we weren't, that we were missing. And if you started thinking about things like that economically disempowered people are just so much easier to push around. And, and I know that in, in the States, at least the key to generational wealth Mm -hmm. and wealth creation and giving it to your kids is actually ownership of some sort or another usually home ownership. And that is like, that is the reason why the wealth gap is so crazy. And so, and as bad as it is right now within the, within the States, because there were programs that allowed white families to actually generate income and, and property that was absolutely denied from, that was actually denied to black folks for many years and other people of color, believe me, because the generational wealth gap goes across. It's not just white to black. It's, it's white to like all, like everybody else. And um, so that kind of preferential treatment um, often goes unaddressed still to this day, even though now everybody knows that, no, it was done quite on purpose, but it's kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do now? I think listening to some of the ways that you described South Bronx, how it was treated by developers and urban planners. I mean, first of all, I would imagine that for listeners, it's going to resonate in a lot more places than just your community, just the space. Oh, yeah. Well, I want to jump ahead to a little bit because you've had such a huge, you know, your work has spanned, what, three decades now? Three, pushing three Oof. decades, is that right? Almost, more? yeah. Oh, my gosh, Sorry. almost, yeah. It's getting yeah. up there. It's true. There have been wins. There have been controversies mm-hmm. as well. Like, yeah. how has that been in terms of, you know, and I guess for me, because of the name of the podcast, it's about if I rule the world, it's about leadership, it's about change making. And ultimately, like what I'm trying to sort of build a picture from with every guest I speak to is are there features of change makers? Are there, is there a certain type of person? Is there a certain pattern to the way they work? Is there a template, a blueprint for how we make positive change? So just from your experience, like looking at the, the, the successes, 
but also the places that you've hit like barriers or you've been pushed back like mm. how have you negotiated your path through all of that <laughs> like what have been the real difficulties i guess i mean look any leader anybody who steps up is a uh, like the cutest way i've heard it described is is called the the tall poppy syndrome and i've heard they call that in australia so the tall poppy the one that that grows up above all the others somebody's going to want to cut it down right they just will it's literally you get caught trying and you're not going to make everybody happy believe me you will make some very very happy and you you maybe even a lot but there's always going to be somebody who's just going to be like whether it should have been me or why why that one and you know it's just part of the game and you, it it just is and and if that's all that it takes to stop you from moving forward then maybe you should consider something else those of us that have been struggling to do this kind of work i really get the feeling that we've been led to believe that we can't really work together and i do feel like that is often how we move through the world and i also just just to let you know the the kind of term that like the the so this book i wrote i use a term called instead of the neighborhoods that are usually called you know poor or um disadvantaged i mean i use the term low status because i think that term tends to imply that it, it, it that inequality is at work that's larger i think than just poverty and i also wanted to be really clear that even though it often has to do with race it doesn't always so since we are led to believe that there's no real value in our community such as it is in comparison to higher status ones and that feeling kind of gets internalized even amongst people who are allegedly fighting the good fight and who are working in develop community development and community advocacy there's still i think this tension that since things don't ever really get better they never will and i think the nonprofit industrial complex or our government development even sometimes education reinforce the idea that things will never really change you know let's just make their poverty manageable let's make their lives a little bit better and let's make sure that we get the talented ones out cuz that's what we do you know if it's if you're really smart you know or athletic or artistic there will be programs and people will find ways to get you out i was one of them so i can speak firsthand about all these things and but when you come back and stay that's that's just it almost doesn't compute it's like why would you do that you 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 can get out of here why would you stay and you want to change things like yeah. think you can it's like yeah i know i can and i know you can too if you wanted to but do you really want to and that's the challenge i recognize that is challenging for people to accept So, wow. Um there's so much there. So I'm just going to jump in here for a quick shout out to our exclusive sponsors, Triodos Bank UK, the ethical and sustainable bank that knows all about being a front runner, a disruptor, and what it takes to stick your neck out. When they first got going over 30 years ago, long before being green and ethical was a thing to be, their offices were in an old, tired Georgian building in Bristol, and they were kind of known as the funny little green bank. Well, since then, they've helped set the standard and now win industry awards every single year awards that didn't even exist when they first got to work with changing the financial system from within by making sure that customers money does not go into the arms industry fossil fuel industries and only ever goes towards positive change so obviously the job is not done yet and there's a long way to go but if you want to be a front runner you've got to start somewhere and you got to stick by your guns And that's exactly what Triodos Bank have done. You can find out more about what they do on their website, and it's why I'm really proud to have them as the exclusive sponsors of If I Rule the World. 
I wanted to just get here from you, Majora, if that's okay. Um, you know, like some specifics where you've had that pushback because it's uncomfortable. Because to uh-huh. me, like maybe one oh, way yeah. of looking at it is, did you commit the cardinal sin <laughs> of trying to <laughs> save the world, quote unquote, and make money too? Like, it was that yes. the problem? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, yes, I, I committed the cardinal sin of trying to save the world mm-hmm. and make some money. And I feel like mm-hmm. I've been more successful in, at the first and not so much at the latter, even though people like to think that I'm a filthy rich woman, but that's, a, it, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But um, I want to give two examples because I really feel like I learned from mm-hmm. the first one a lot. So the first one was, uh, I was early in, in my career as a consultant, I had taken on a client that it was called Fresh Direct and they were an online grocer. They were in Queens, New York, and which was a part of New York City. And they just grew so much and they got a deal to stay in New York City. And they ended up getting a deal to come to the South Bronx and build their their warehouse there in this area that was actually zoned by right for some of the most polluting infrastructure that you could have. The deal that they got was that they had none of their incentives would come through unless they hired a thousand people. You know, they were really interested local people. And they also had a commitment to environmental support systems, which I thought was really helpful. They wanted to open up a compressed natural gas fueling station so that other um, businesses would be able to also fuel their tanks there. And at the time we had a congressman who was basically like trying to dole out money to support the the, um, the transformation of fleets. So it just seemed like, ooh, you know, is it perfect? Absolutely not. But is this something that I think that overall our community could benefit from? Yes, definitely. And, but <laughs> unbeknownst to me, um, it turns out that there was like a group of people who had already decided even before I took this client on that I was way too big for my britches and that they were going to tear me down as a result of taking this client on and just to show that I was just this, this corporate whore. But anyway, Mm -hmm. instead they called me a shadowy poverty pimp dress, which I thought was kind of creative actually. And also I'm like, wait, I'm the pimp dress, which means I'm in the power position. I'm not somebody's whore. I appreciated that. So that was pretty funny to me. Mm-hmm. I thought it was funny. But anyway, I uh, but I ended up taking this as a as a job because I realized that by putting a target on my own head, I could actually protect the folks in the community who actually did want to see this thing come and provide them cover to do their jobs. Unfortunately, we were unable and failed miserably because there were so many lawsuits. The company was just like, we, even with all the, the benefits we were going to get, we can't open a fueling station. We can't, we can't do, we, we can't do all that stuff that we wanted to do, which is, I think, fair, but they were able to do some other cool stuff that made me, that I was just like, I'm glad, again, worth painting a target on my head um, because they totally went after me. I was a part of, it was a years long social media campaign that ended with me on the front page of the New York Times with on the literally front page above the fold. And this is back when people still read newspapers like in, in their hands. Mm. <laughs> and to go by a newsstand and to see my face on it, literally with the head title above it, hero of the South Bronx, now accused of betraying it. And I'm like, mm. they're talking about me. So that was that. And I really... What I'd learned at that point was that, look, I put this, I don't think I would have done it differently because again, the goal was to get the work done, which Mm -hmm. meant if you're going to attack me, I guarantee you, I'm going to be standing at the end of this. And of course I was, I mean, believe me, I was hurt by it as well. Um, because I knew some of the people who were actively in the nonsense and it was just like, just, I still can't believe how like, frankly, punk some people are. It's just like, you see me yeah. every day. You can't have a conversation. Fast forward when you know I moved directly into development. 
and acquired this little rail station which we wanted to transform into an event hall. We call it Bronxlandia. You know, and it's an event hall, which means people rent it out They're for parties, for shoots, for all sorts of things. It's important to have a liquor license. And that's part of your, that's how you, you're going to work your performer and how you're going to make some money off of this thing. And I was targeted in every single way. So almost immediately, they started a campaign against me getting my liquor license. And so when we finally went in front of the, the state liquor authority and putting in our application, like one of the first things that the head asked me was, um, why do they hate you so much? Which I thought was like a, wow. like a crazy question to be asked in a public forum, you know, by the a commissioner, <laughs> the commissioner. Yeah. Um, and I just says, you know what, you'll have to ask them yourselves. So they were able to withdraw the whole thing. And essentially what I did was do something that I don't normally do, which was I vocalized it. I made it very public what I was doing, um, you know, in social media and other avenues. So what did you say ex exactly, like, you know, on uh, those platforms? Oh, I said I, I am being targeted by in some incredibly anti-Black, anti-woman nonsense in this community from the community board in particular and they are standing so this is, in hang on i'm just trying to work out so the, so your community is is predominantly black and brown and it's so predominantly latino was coming from your latino okay right. mostly latino. latino so we're men. getting into shades of mm -hmm. of black yep. and brown here okay yep so you you know black woman oh mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. no <laughs> and you know here i, I wow. mean literally okay. i am probably one of the most prominent people of any kind, you know, in this, in this community. And mm -hmm. I, it should not be me, you know, who has acquired this incredibly strategic piece of real estate, you know, in line to do a lot more. And I think it just enraged them. And, and I was just like, I'm going to take your rage and I'm going to show it. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to put it up for people to see. And and like to show that what your rage, like your anti-blackness, your anti-woman, everything that you do is literally getting in the way of progress, not just for me personally, but for what this project could bring to this community. So I named it 100% and put it out on all the social media I could. And it was one of the most amazing responses I've ever had because I vocalized it and did not skimp on anything, folks were able to see what I was going through. And I got an incredible amount of support, an incredible amount of support that unfortunately it, what, it did not help because of even the community board understood exactly when to throw this kind of shade at me that would make it so that I would literally lose five months of revenue. And so yes, economically, I suffer. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But mm -hmm what I got in terms of real community support was one of the most incredible things I've ever experienced. And that was, hmm. they came, they came out to community board hearings. I was not alone. And, and these other people were exposed and I'm very happy about that. I really am. I do feel like that there's something about the word community that kind of gets misread. For me, the definition or the meaning of community is like people that you may or may not get on with and you may or may not agree with, but you got to work together anyway. Yeah. And it's there's that feeling of you are maybe not stuck, but that's where you are and that's what you're going to invest in, right? What you described, that is community. Mm -hmm. But I feel like what often gets misinterpreted as community is community leaders, whether they're most of them appointed in some way, shape, or form. And mm -hmm. it is it's a particular type of status that is relegated to certain people. And they and and it is, it's it is a clicky, awful, disgusting thing that I look at because I've and I've witnessed it and experienced it not just in my own neighborhood and certainly not just in New York, but you know, I know people from all over the world. And it's just like it's the same kind of thing where it's like you've got people 
who are like appointed by the powers that be in some way. And it makes them feel just a little bit more important than everybody else. And, and suddenly they're the deciders of who gets to, who gets okay. to talk, who gets to be important. Yeah. And it's just like, like, who died and made you king? That is a great segue. I love the who died and made you king. Um, because <laughs> we're going to play the game now of If I Rule oh, the World. Oh, yes. If I um, Rule the World. So, yeah. And I think it is actually a really good po- place to jump in with these questions because it, it's it's starting to get into the nuts and bolts of, I say that a lot, nuts and balls. I've got to find a new expression, but you know, it's <laughs> it getting works. into the detail <laughs> of like leadership and who do we lead? Who do we follow? Do we get asked? Do we get told? All that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I guess noticing the way I'm speaking, I'm like, I'm putting myself in, yeah, in, in the, in the, I'm positioning myself with the people at the moment, right? So mm. You've been elected, like we had this big global election and it was a democratic process and they picked you. So you have the mandate, you know, it's not a dictatorship. And so we're going to kick off with you. Yeah, yeah. You're the leader of the world and it's your first day in office and your first task is to ban or outlaw stuff, right? Like where okay. do you start Oof. with that? I know. As someone who generally likes to start with like what can what can we do first, like in a positive way? That mm-hmm. that was that mm-hmm. that question took me aback a little bit. But I was like, but no, some things really do need to be banned. They just do. You know, I was when I saw the question, I think I was just thinking, what would like have such an impact everywhere? And I I don't I think mm-hmm. I'd say assault rifles. It just wow. Because it impacts everybody everywhere and just like the kind of vicious horrific murder and violence and fear that it generates i mean it, it, everywhere just globally mm. and that they're still made and you could find parts for them anywhere and they're still devastating people around the world like everywhere so uh, that I, that was honestly the first thing that came to mind wow that's very specific because there's a lot of weaponry out there. Yeah, but, so but those are like... particular or are you kind of pulling it all together? It's person to person. I mean, it's just uh-huh. like, it is literally the kind of thing that that I think you know, wrecks havoc, you know, within... It's probably a lot more than that too, but mm-hmm. but I know that what is it, the, the AK-47 is kind of considered like the Volkswagen of, of artillery because I've never they're heard so that before. Yeah. No, yeah, because they're sense. so easy. Makes they're sense. totally easy. Okay. Yeah. So that's a nice yeah. clear first task. That'd be one thing. You would have to um well, I'm sure you'd have plenty of policies, but what would be your first top 3 policies that you would enact? I think one of them would definitely kind of like and it might feel small or sound small, but if mm-hmm. you do it all over the world, it's, it adds up. I just feel like if we can find and really build on many of the natural ways to restore the planet and do those things, individ- in, in, whether it's in urban areas, coast, obviously coastal areas, but all around the, the world, and be very targeted as to what we're doing, I think it would put people to work. I think it would create new opportunities for, to help deal with global warming in a very specific way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and those two things alone would be, I think, really amazing. Would you have a vision for, because one, one of the words that I love in terms of a word that should be pulled into all of the discussions around just basically positive change, which is like human dignity. Mm-hmm. So how would you make sure that these jobs that you're creating and putting people to work basically give, A, you know, are sort of have a sense of purpose, but, but more yeah. than anything, like people still kind of, there's a, well, not even a degree. It is completely about human dignity. Yeah. You know, because like right now there's like a lot of work being created in the Congo Basin. It's far mm. from dignified though. But are they doing it because of who's... Or- because of who's doing it. Like, are the people that are actually doing that work considered expendable, period. And so that's why mm-hmm. they're not enacting the kind of, of safeguards around people's health and safety. Mm-hmm. So straight up, that's not what I'm talking about. But 
you know, I feel like, you know, especially after running the, the green collar job training and placement system that we did for as long as we did, we wanted people to have a, a personal and a financial stake in understanding the, how the environment could be improved for them mm-hmm. and for the world. And I feel like that was the ethos in which we like placed our program that it's just like, yes, this is this, this green infrastructure project, whether you're figuring out how to do, um, uh, waterfront restoration or tree pruning or whatever it is you're doing, or just like understanding like the components of structured soil Mm -hmm. so that it's more permeable. And, you know, it actually provides a much more, uh, a more sustainable opportunity for there to be, you know, to impact urban heat island. Like people under, like once they understood, then it was just like, well, this is, this is like the work that I want to be doing. I know the impact that I'm, that I have. Okay. And what would your third policy be? Well, my third policy be definitely looking at because there's an all there's definitely data around wealth inequality and why it happens. The third policy would be to actually deal with it through real sustainable opportunities, like some but like the same ones that were used that allowed white Americans to basically build up generational wealth. How are we doing that for other people, you know, color within? this within, within the, within the world, because I know it's not just, it didn't just happen here, you know, structural um, wealth inequality exists everywhere. And I think there's enough precedent out there, you know, to show it's like you do, you've got to make investments in people and in their future wealth creating potential. And here it was something, I think a very simple thing, social security, but when it was first put in place, they just put in a little little thing saying, well, if you are a domestic worker or an agricultural worker, which was the majority of people of color in this country, then they didn't, then they weren't eligible. Or if you fought in a war, you weren't going to happen to be of color. You didn't get the GI Bill that helped you buy a house or go to college or anything like that. Those are the kind of things that we need to see happening across the board so that we can, I I think when we all do well, we all do well. But yeah, I'd want to figure out how to do that. Those are the things I'd want my my team to do like right away. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the the questions that comes up a lot, and I guess maybe it's not even a question, a statement that I hear a lot in this space is that capitalism is the problem, right? But capitalism is at the moment our vehicle for wealth creation. So in some ways, do you think you can solve these problems within this present system? Or do you think we would need to, you would, you with all your advisors and, you know, mm-hmm. would come up with a new system? I think it'd be groovy if we can come up with a new one or, or take pieces of the old one and add something else to it. Like I, look, I feel like there have been people way smarter than I have, I am that have tried to dismantle capitalism. And, but I also think that the real problem with, with capitalism is that its benefits have been just so disproportionately applied. Like, because imagine if everybody was able to have access to capital to purchase a home, based on exactly who they are in a very, in the same way, mm-hmm. we, we would not have much of the wealth inequality that we have right now. But the bottom line is there's a structure in, literally in place, you know, and I don't know if you've heard of like some of the like things that are very recent around how the way a homes that have the, just the presence of black people in them are appraised at lower values in the same exact neighborhood. So that's why people will seen, like take. Re- yeah, I have seen yeah. some recent articles about this, which is wow. I, yeah, I haven't really dug into it, to, but I've seen caught the headlines. But let's just say, oh, it's yeah. That's all you need to know. It's like literally, you know, wow. somebody comes to appraise your house, you take down the pictures of anything that would remotely indicate that there are black people there. You have a friend, a white friend, like basically pretend to be you. That's what you do. You. I mean, I personally have, <laughs> you know, had to like do all sorts of stupid things, you know, knowing full well that it was just like I had to either minimize myself um, in order for people to like see me as worthy mm-hmm. of even getting a loan. I do it in a heartbeat. So, yeah, 
Like I want to deal with wealth inequality and the structural issues behind it. And, and if it means that we can do it easily through turning capitalist vehicles and making sure they work to support um, people of color, I'll do it. If there's another one, I'll do that too. We'll just fast forward it. You've done a great job. Everyone's real happy. Maybe the few things you got wrong, but you know what? Yeah, we're all human, right? And, exactly. um, and you have now reached the end of your term. And there's a lovely process in place to make sure that this is the bit, actually, I've just realized this game is screwed up here because you're appointing a successor rather than we getting a democratically elected one. But we're going to roll with it. You're going to at least nominate well, and then we get to I, vote. I, I How about that? that? <laughs> I, I totally thought that too. And that's why I was like, I focused on the word nominate because I was like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not like not even trying to like go like you are my hair pick successor. But when I think about my the work that, that I do now and the fact that I'm pushing on 60 soon and I'm getting really tired, but know that the work's not done. And, and I think about, so it, it's more of like, there is no one nominee. Mm -hmm. It's just a large, broad group of people that I feel like I want folks to understand my successes and also learn from my mistakes, which are considerable. And keep in mind that our ultimate job, if you want to step into this world, or even if you don't, uh, you know, of actually stepping up and being like, okay, I'll lead, blah, 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 in some way, I'll get caught trying. It's got to be somebody who feels as though they can be in it for the long run because it is grueling and not always satisfying, but ultimately know why they're doing it, which is to be in service and to make other people's lives a little bit better. And I know that doesn't really answer your question at all, but I think I was kind of struck by this whole idea of like mm. a, a, a successor nominee or whatever. And I was just like, I don't know. Because I feel like if, if, if we're really, if we kind of like cast a big net and help people see the value that everybody can lead in some way, mm. then, and then we really sit down and, and talk about, okay, like who's the best one who, like for this thing? I felt I've been in situations like that in my in my earlier career, where it was just like, okay, in this particular moment, like we're all leaders, right? We're all leaders. But who in this particular moment, in this particular situation, who needs to be the lead? Mm. And the rest of us are going to hang back because we know that it's all in service of the, of the real thing that we want. And I feel like that's what we kind of have to get to if we're going to really be thinking about building a real batch so that it becomes like, any one of us could could be in that position, but which one of us wants to actually do it? Because honestly, if I look back on it, I don't. I would have done everything differently. Really? That's not true. Not everything, <laughs> um, but a lot of things. I, I think I would have done differently. Like, I know this sounds terrible, but mm. I think for some of the higher profile projects, I probably would have not been in the lead on them or be seen as the lead on them. I probably would have been leading from behind, but I just felt like honestly being a black woman did not serve and it made it more difficult. I, I know who I am. I know mm-hmm. what I've done, right? And I know what I'm going to do in the future, mm-hmm. but if it just made it easier to like get to the finish line quicker and then reveal it all at the, at the end, that could have been a really telling thing to do and yeah. like a really powerful way to pitch it. And not always, but sometimes I do think we have to think about strategy mm. just so that we can get to the finish line. Cause at this point, I think it's more important for us to win. And, and I'm not talking, and, and I'm not just saying, and I don't think it needs to be by any means necessary because that those are some, those are, the kind of words that people often use that I don't think you have to be that horrible all the time. Mm. And I won't, I will not, but I'm not trying to um, do anything that 
my mother's not going to be proud of me. (laughs) Um, Like that's just not going to happen. But the way the world is right now, just right now, like I know that there's going to have to be where we are. It's, it's going to take some time for people to recognize that it's in everyone's best interest for all of us to Mm. move forward together. And I know not everybody's ready Mm. that I do know. I was just thinking, just as a last question, an extension really of the thought you just had about everyone moving forward together. Like, how would you expand that, your experience beyond that identity of a black woman who's tried to take the lead? But just, I'm thinking about my listeners who, you know, actually quite international. And I'm really proud of this, actually. I'm proud that the podcast is attracting as far as I can tell from the demographics that we keep a close eye on, you know, a real broad range of people, white, black, young, old, male, female, you know, in different Mm -hmm. parts of the world. So is there, is there a way for you to kind of like zoom out of the identity and really just think about that idea of like, you you know, how do we move forward together? Because definitely my take at the moment in, in fact, even when it comes to the real hot button topics like climate change and even race, there's some things that I'm like, I don't think I would be talking about that anymore, mainly because it's so divisive. And mm-hmm. I personally, and I know a lot of people feel like this, I don't, I've, I've never experienced a world like we're living in right now. And it really makes me mm-hmm. sad. So my take on it is that I would rather at the moment, I know this is going to sound really dramatic and probably take a lot of heat from it, but... <laughs> I'd rather go down like on a sinking ship together than some of us made it off onto the lifeboats and others didn't. Mm. And I'm like, how do we get a message out there that doesn't minimize the experiences of marginalized people, but still pulls together? So it's not like I don't have hope. I do very, very much so. I just feel as though I want to spend most of my time finding ways to build the kind of community that make people feel good about where they are, mm-hmm. like along with other folks who help get them that way. Mm-hmm. And that's really, that's really it. Like I, you know, the people that I look at as partners and comrades, they, it's a, it's a myriad of people. I mean, that's the beautiful part that it's mm-hmm. not it's not just black women. I mean, believe me, they're at a special place in my heart. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But st- straight up, I-, I couldn't get where I am with like a bunch of white men behind me, supporting me, you know, in various ways. Um, and they are few and far between. <laughs> so I'm uh, thinking, I'm thinking of poor Sam and Jake at the moment, <laughs> hidden behind there. <laughs> Don't you know what? It's it's, it's good. It, it's because it's teasing. I'm teasing. It's like, I know, I know, I know. But I but I think it's like I had a mentor who said to me once. She's like, you know, I think that the world would be in a much better place if there were actually more white men working for black women, because it would be like normal. And that's part of the problem. It's nothing's normal, or I don't think it's normal to, mm. to for there to be like the levels of wealth and the wealth inequality, like just the levels of subjugation, you know, of people Mm. just because of who they were born, the skin they were born in, like that should be considered not normal. And, but the second we look at it that way, suddenly, then it's just like, oh, we can, we can change that. We can do something about it. And it's okay. Mm. It's all, it really is okay. Well, Majora, thank you. I'm really um, grateful for your time. Um, And I'm grateful that, you know, you've been very generous about talking about your the things that you you know you feel you didn't get right Uh, that's not something many people like to go into but it's it's Mm. valuable learning for everybody and I'm really grateful so thank you thank you thank you for having me (laughs) I had a whole list of questions for Majora about being an eco-entrepreneur and we really didn't get into the details about her work in urban regeneration in urban greening Green job creation, all of that is in her book, Reclaiming Your Community, if you want to find out more. Another thing to mention is we recorded this episode before Biden stepped down and before Kamala Harris was announced as the U.S. Democratic Party presidential candidate. 
So before the world was presented with a very real possibility that we might actually see a woman of color as the president of the United States. Honestly, I thought this was something that we were a long ways off from seeing. But here we are. And it makes this conversation with Majora more timely than we could have possibly known when we recorded it. One of Majora's takeaways from her experience as a leader, that being a black woman did not serve her, hit hard. And actually hit producer Sam and editor Jake harder than I thought it would. So this is either a harbinger for this next chapter in US politics, or it's a sign that through the experiences of people like Majora, and billions of women of color around the world, including yours truly, that the learning is paying off and that the world is ready for change. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Let me know what your takeaways are. Maybe you glean something completely different. You can comment on Spotify. You can comment on my Instagram, Jillian's underscore voice, or you can email the show, the podcast at podcast at JillianBurkeVoice.com. I would absolutely love to hear from you. I'd love more suggestions as well of topics, of guests, of people that you'd like to hear on the podcast for more conversations like this one. And most of all, if you know someone who you think will enjoy the podcast, please share it and help spread the word. So it's approaching the end of August. I can't believe we are looking at that home straight now on 2024 and what a year it's been for the podcast so far. We're not going anywhere, mungu akipenda, as they would say in Swahili, God willing. But I feel, I don't know, I feel a little bit moved to show some gratitude. I I feel so lucky to be able to do this podcast, to be able to bring these conversations to you. I'm really excited about the conversations to come. We've got some really brilliant guests lined up, so more on that soon. I feel so lucky to have exclusive sponsors, Triodos Bank UK, who don't just front the costs of making this podcast, but have been genuine cheerleaders behind the scenes. Many of the meetings, many of the conversations that we have, um, frankly, are podcast-worthy material <laughs> as well. But yeah, the Triodos team really believe in the podcast and really believe in what they do. So I feel very lucky for that. Oh man, I feel so lucky to have a great, great team in Editor Jake and Producer Sam at Soundquake Productions. And last but not least, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for showing up for every episode, for energizing us and making all of this possible. We've got some really exciting plans in the pipeline for creating a space where we can keep these conversations going. So yeah, stay tuned for that. I think I'll leave it there for now, though, um, yeah, with my usual sign-off and invitation to take a moment and take a breath. And as you do, ask yourself, if you rule the world, what would you do? Thanks for listening.